in the middle. <laughs> yep. Something in the water in Germany. <laughs> Thank you, Commissioner, uh, for that uh, introduction. Um, and yes, I'm aware this is a uh, time slot immediately after lunch when uh, you all were fed and tired. I'm doing my best to keep you entertained, but I must warn you, I don't dance as well as the performance, the performance that I did earlier. Also, not as much as a stand up comedian as the um, cultural ambassador was. And I'm going to talk about regulation. And um, regulation sounds like something dry and boring to many people. Many of you may prefer to, to hear something more exciting than I hear today about the latest cybersecurity threats. Is that working? Is it? Yeah. Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah. They decided to do this. Yeah. How do we catch the bad guys? But regulation, regulation is actually important, very important. We will ensure exactly that. That cybercrime, um, which we've already heard quite a bit, this morning, cybercrime can be dealt with on the, uh, on the enforcement level, and also, but more importantly, I think we can use this. Security Awareness Conference that will be held. Yeah. Three yeah, so days. I and some of the other speakers uh, tomorrow and the day after. At first, it we'll was the uh, official opening, yeah. which is important, as I was just saying, to ensure that the done by the president of the Republic of Nigeria. Yeah. Now is the uh, teaching session on right the uh, interactive session. But more importantly, this is, uh, one of the speakers that. Is, uh, Critical infrastructure in particular, but also companies and individuals um, can be better protected. My name is um, And so that um, uh, more cyber incidents can be prevented before they, before they actually happen. Um, so regulation can uh, support um, good practices to be adopted um, to, to uh, make that happen. Um, I'll talk about, um, I'll start by talking briefly about the different components of regulation. Then I'll talk about what some other countries um, are doing in that regard. Then we'll take a look at the current situation in Liberia. And uh, then I have another document uh, for you after this PowerPoint, a draft cybersecurity regulatory framework that I'll go through um, with you with some discussion points in there, and then we'll talk about the next steps. So the four components of regulation briefly. Most of you will be aware of this. Many of you are with the regulator or are dealing with the regulator uh, frequently in the LTA. Uh, basically four components here starting with the policy. So a policy is a broad strategy or a plan that uh, just outlines goals and principles. Uh, and then legislation comes in on top of that to support the implementation of such goals and principles. So legislation means these are actual laws or acts that are um, legally binding 
and um, define rights, responsibilities, and procedures uh, that must be followed, legally binding, and also cannabis um, in uh, cases of non compliance with these um, rules and procedures. Thirdly, then regulations, the actual regulations can come in on top of legislation. Regulations typically um, go into more detail and provide more detailed rules um, defining how exactly the laws are to be implemented. Um, they're also legally binding. So both um, legislation and regulations are legally binding as opposed to the guidelines down there, the fourth component that I'll talk about briefly uh, next, which are voluntary. Most legislation and regulation are legally binding. Um, and there, we have some flexibility um, in terms of how much we want to include in the actual legislation and how much of that we want to move into the more detailed regulations that sit on top of the legislation. And we'll see that in the examples that I'll talk about of other countries, uh, how they've done it um, in a moment. Guidelines, um, fourth component there, voluntary guidelines, as I mentioned, are um, not legally binding and are designed to promote good practices um, among stakeholders, users, um, uh, in terms of cybersecurity, to promote good practices to uh, prevent incidents from happening so that fewer people, companies, players, come into conflict with these uh, laws and regulations. Um, and for the regulations, of course, or as, I, as I mentioned, um, the, um, they're legally binding like actual laws, but they're actually not, um, they don't go through a, uh, through the, uh, Legal of the, the, the political process. Uh, laws are obviously passed by parliament. Regulations are made by regulators, such as the LTA, LTA uh, here in uh, Liberia. Um, and um, so, um, how do we decide? how much we want to put into the legislation and how much into the, the regulation sitting on top of that. Um, the difference is that um, every time you want to make a change, when the environment changes or technologies change, if you have everything in the laws themselves and the actual legislation, you would have to go back to Parliament to pass a change in the law. Whereas regulations have the advantage, um, they can be more easily enacted and also more easily modified, so you're more flexible to adjust your legislations and regulations to changes in the environment. Um, however, laws have the advantage, they have stronger enforcement mechanisms so that's the trade-off, and we'll, we'll see it in a few examples of other countries, how they have uh, dealt with that. So for those reasons, it's quite a patchwork that we see when we, when we look at other countries, um, what cyber security regulation looks like. I'll talk today um, about uh, two of the most advanced economies in that regard, the US and the EU. Um, another speaker tomorrow will then zero in more on Africa and, and talk more about what some of our neighbors here in Africa um, currently have they're doing in terms of cybersecurity regulation. Places like Nigeria, uh, South Africa, Kenya, and a few others. Considered 
regional leaders here uh, in Africa. And I'll also show you some best practice guidelines, these voluntary guidelines, examples from some other countries. And also the UN, the United Nations are coming in uh, here. They have um, norms um, of responsible state behavior in cyberspace uh, that we can also take a brief look at. So let's uh, look at the US here as uh, example number one. Um, the US is a bit of a particular case, and here as well, um, in terms of cyber security regulation and legislation, because uh, as you will know, we often have federal laws and then state laws in the US, and there are federal taxes and state taxes, um, which often complicates things and creates these two layers of legislation that. Um, stakeholders have to deal with. Uh, the same we see here in terms of cyber security regulation. So let's look at the federal level first, federal cyber security laws in the US. And I'm, I've just highlighted here some key uh, ones. There are other pieces of legislation that also exist, but the ones I've listed here are the key ones that um, show us a number of things. Um, number one, that it is quite a long process um, to develop legislation. As you can see here, with the first ones I've, I've listed, this goes back to the 1980s in the US. 1986, um, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was enacted, and the Electronic Communications Privacy Act. Uh, these are as you can see there, um, they deal with the fundamentals of cybersecurity. So the first one, the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act, um, is basically what we today would call a cybersecurity act. In many other countries, it's something like that is called the Cybersecurity Act. Uh, basically, it uh, defines um, certain actions that are prohibited, um, cyber crimes basically, and defines penalties. Um, legal actions and the Electronic Communication Privacy Act, also going back to 1986, deals with um, data privacy and protection. So, in many other countries, you'll see laws um, with titles like that Data Protection Act, Data Privacy Act. So, in the US, this goes back, this goes back to the 1980s. Um, here for the US, I've listed them in chronological order. So uh, come the early 2000s, um, the Federal Information Security Management Act came in, FISMA. Uh, that one deals with uh, government agencies in particular. So it obliges government agencies, uh, not the private sector, but government agencies specifically, um, that they must have, uh, they must develop programs plans to manage their cybersecurity, um, including continuous monitoring, uh, incident response plans, and management procedures. Uh, last on this page, Cybersecurity cyber Information Sharing Act, CISA, in uh, 2015. Uh, this one, that is, this is actually interesting. This, um, this act deals with some conflicts that other pre-existing uh, legislation created um, in terms of um, when it comes to reporting cyber incidents, other existing laws um, prevented the disclosure of some personal data. For example, let's say in the medical sector, um, a hospital was the target of a cyber attack um, the regulator would like to know about this to, to deal with the cyber incident, uh, requiring the disclosure of some data. The hospital would then come and say, hang on, such and such legislation prevents us from disclosing some of this data because it's personal information that we're prohibited from disclosing. Um, the Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act then dealt with this conflict. 
by saying when it comes specifically to the reporting of cyber incidents, um, there is legal protection um, for disclosing some personal data if that's necessary to deal with the cyber incident. More on the federal level before we turn to, if we to the state level legislation in the US. Uh, the Cyber Incident Reporting for Credit Infrastructure Act came in in 2022. So this one deals with the same thing reporting of cyber um, incidents, specifically dealing with critical infrastructure, which is a particularly important sector. Many of you here are concerned with. But many countries have legislation specifically dealing with cyber security for critical infrastructure sectors. Um, and uh, look at the year 2022, what happened in 2022, um, the invasion of Ukraine probably played a role in this legislation coming about when we realized all of a sudden how vulnerable uh, critical infrastructure can be. The gas pipelines were being attacked in the Baltic Sea, submarine cables were being attacked. So, um, as we can see, it's a, it's a continuous process. As new developments occur, legislation, new, legis new, new legislation is required to deal with those and is sometimes in conflict with older existing legislation, which then requires qualifications to resolve those conflicts. Uh, this act here, the Cersei Act of 2022, also introduced uh, specific um, uh, time limits here for uh, reporting cyber incidents, uh, 72 hours, so within 72 hours of an incident, uh, they will have to be reported, it's actually 24 hours for ransomware. Again, in recent years, 2022, around then, ransomware attacks became more and more common. So legislation dealt with that specifically. And this threat not emerged, but became more and more prevalent. Um, legislation and regulations were brought into the other. Going back to the 1980s, as we saw, so really over a period of almost 40 years, these different pieces of legislation have evolved over several decades in the US. Uh, and these ones down here, um, the little gap in between um, are some sector specific legislation that also exists uh, over there. For example, the HIPA Act there, Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. That is a much broader uh, piece of legislation. It doesn't only deal with cybersecurity. Uh, it deals with health insurance more broadly. Um, but um, uh, but a specific uh, section in there, the security rule, deals with protection of um, electronic health information, which is a particularly sensitive area. People's, people's health information deserves particular attention. Uh, the Grand Leach Liley Act of 1999, uh, similar for the financial industry. Specific um, uh, legislation for the financial sector to protect sensitive customer data. Finance is another particularly important area for that. And last but not least, the uh, Sarbanes-Oxley Act. Um, that one uh, deals with, um, with financial data used by publicly traded companies. So the big companies that are publicly traded, publicly listed, it's their financial report. Uh, this act um, imposes a specific uh, requirements on that. Again, look at the year 2002, what happened around that time in terms of financial um, data and accounting 
Enron scandal. Many of you will be old enough to remember that, 2001, I think that was, which was a major financial accounting scandal in the US. So events like that um, trigger uh, the development of legislation. Um, here in Liberia, um, we are um, behind in these developments. We're at the very beginning um, of, of um, developing legislation and regulations for cybersecurity. But there's actually a good side to that. There's a good side to being a bit late and being a bit behind because we can we can now basically learn from mistakes that, that others have made, or maybe not, I shouldn't take, say mistakes, but experiences that other countries have had and adjustments they've had to make over time, over several decades, as we saw here. And we have an opportunity here to uh, develop um, more comprehensive and more consistent um, legislation in Liberia that takes all of these developments into account and maybe compresses them more into fewer pieces of legislation with less potential for conflicts between them. Right. Um, oh yeah, state level um, legislation. Um, so as I mentioned, the US um, often a particular case in this regard. So on top of the federal legislation that we looked at, there's a lot of um, state level legislation, um, this is just, those dots there uh, indicate there's a lot of the California Consumer Privacy Act uh, 2018 deals with, as the name suggests, with that, separately from the federal uh, regulations. And in New York, for example, the SHIELD Act, um, SHIELD, which stands for Stop Tax and Improve Electronic Data Security, SHIELD, which is one of these uh, acronyms that they sometimes come up with. They, uh, they, they massage it until it's descriptive of what it's, what it's dealing with, and at the same time results in a, in a very uh, funky descriptive, descriptive um, acronym as well, SHIELD, shielding uh, us from these hacks. All states have. Um, did something happen here? Okay. Oh, yeah. um, all 50 states, for example, have data breach notification. So, what we saw on the federal level there as well, certain time limits for reporting cyber incidents. Then um, there are some industry specific regulations in the US as well. Um, just briefly naming them here, for example, again in the, in the financial industry, the payment card industry data security standard, uh, PCI DSS. Um, so these are regulations, not laws. This is not a law, but it's also mandatory. It's also legally binding. It's a regulation. And for the um, Power industry, the electricity industry, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation, NERC, so they have critical infrastructure protection standards. Actually, this one should probably be listed under here under best practice standards. It's more, more one of these voluntary best practice standards rather than a regulation. Uh, the NERC is a non profit organization uh, in the US including many of the electricity providers and um, they simply created these, um, these uh, guidelines, these standards um, to promote good practices in that particular industry. Other best practice standards down there, um, the NIST framework, National Institute of Standards and Technology. Many of you will have heard of that. That's very widely 
U.S. and beyond. Um, uh, other countries are looking at this as well and, and uh, um, are using it as their, as their own guideline. Is that because that is still on? I think that was EU, I'll keep this um, rather brief, um, similar in many ways. I'm here I'm, I've listed the more recent pieces of legislation and regulation um, that, that they have there. Um, actually, you see a lot of directives uh, there. So in the EU, again, we have a specific situation that is a, um, a group of nations and the EU Parliament um, typically releases something that's called a directive, uh, which is not really a law in itself, but is a directive to the member states to implement this in their national legislation. So, for example, 2015, um, also in the financial sector, the Payment Services Directive, uh, number two, PSD2, so this replaced an older version of that in 2015, uh, requiring stronger authentication methods for online payments, including two-factor authentication, multi-factor authentication. And many of you will have noticed that around that time, a few years ago, 2015, around there, more and more do we, ex we experience online um, for our electronic payments that were required to, to do this multi-factor uh, authentication that came in around that time and more and more uh, breaches were occurring uh, in that sector. So the EU reacted by introducing this uh, legislation. Um, secondly, they have a network and information security directive. Uh, this that deals with critical infrastructure, again, in various sectors there, energy, transport, health, finance. Um, the next one, GDPR, many of you will have heard about that, the general data protection regulations in the EU. It came in in 2018 um, and deals with uh, data protection and privacy for individuals uh, within the EU. But interestingly, the GDPR also applies to organizations outside of the EU that process data of EU residents. So you may ask, um, how is this possible? How can this be enforced outside of the EU? But um, you will have heard of uh, several cases where these penalties that are named there have actually successfully been applied penalties up to 4% of global turnover um, for violations of these uh, regulations or 20 million euros for proper data processing, storage or transfer. Um, I believe the biggest one was the, um, one. I think it was 1.2 billion US dollars that Meta was fined um, fairly recently, a few years ago, for um, improperly using um, some of the data of their, their members. And also the GDPR introduces um, mandatory breach notification deadline, 72 hours, uh, here in this case, um, 72 hours of discovery. Uh, 2019, the Cyber Security Act uh, in the EU. Um, so this wasn't Exactly the first side of the there was other existing legislation that was replaced by this. But this is the uh, basically the new basic cybersecurity law um, that defines um, cyber crimes and penalties. And um, uh, importantly, it established a, a, an EU-wide agency, ENISA, the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, like a, a supranational body within the EU to um, promote, um, uh, to, to, to deal with cybersecurity. 
and it also introduced a, um, a certification framework for uh, products and services uh, with regards to cybersecurity, EU wide. And then the NIS 2 directive, so we just saw the original NIS directive, um, they're dealing with a critical infrastructure. In 2022, that was updated, NIS 2. Um, basically expanded that, the uh, critical infrastructure protection, expanded that into more sectors, uh, additional uh, industry sectors, digital infrastructure, public administration space, um, and had some, some stricter uh, requirements at the same time. Uh, it also mandated that member states, even member states, um, uh, would have to designate a national authority for cybersecurity in the national legislation and stronger enforcement measures or stricter penalties for non-compliance. Digital Operational Resilience Act, DORA 2023, so these are some very recent <coughs> pieces of legislation last year. Uh, this one dealing with the financial service industry again. An interesting aspect of this one, for example, is the fact that for the first time it included third-party service providers as well. So not just the financial institutions themselves, but third-party providers, for example, cloud providers. As more and more information uh, these days is, is being um, uh, stored in the cloud by cloud service providers, uh, there was a need to include those um, in in, in such legislation. E-privacy regulation um, in, um, oh yeah, the year is not there, but that was also recent. Uh, new e-privacy regulation um, was brought in in 2022 or 2023 to replace um, an older piece of legislation, the 2002 e-privacy directive, uh, which was affectionately called the cookie law. We're all familiar here with cookies, right? We got the things we eat, but the um, uh, those little pieces of code that track your um, online movements um, in the, on the internet. Um, and again, you probably noticed in your internet activities that um, recently, uh, a couple of years ago or so, literally every website you visit these days tells you um, and asks you to consent with the tracking. Accept all cookies, or you can select which ones you want to accept. You can also decline, um, but they have to be modified. So that goes back to this legislation being modified. So another example of developments taking place, issues emerging, and then legislation um, being drafted to deal with those new developments. Um, last not least here, the EU Critical Entities Resilience Directive 2022, again dealing with critical infrastructure, promotes the sharing of information relating to cyber threats and incidents. And uh, take a look at that last line there. Member states have until 2026 to transpose this into national legislation. So that again tells us how long these processes can take to actually draft and then pass and enact legislation. So 2022 to 2026, four years um, from the directive, from the EU, um, giving national, the individual states four years to implement this in their national legislation. So it, it does take time. Um, quickly uh, here, an example, another example from country where I live, Australia, for best practice guidelines, so not legislation or regulation, it's legally binding, but these are voluntary guidelines. In Australia, the body, um, the government body that has developed and maintains these is the Australian Cyber Security Center, ACSC, uh, which is part of the Australian Signals Directorate, ASD, and um, is that a link? 
I go to link here just to show what's in there. Maybe exit presentation. link and then click on that and browse through it. Uh, very extensive set of guidelines, if I just put three days guidelines, cyber security, roles, incidents, out outsourcing. practice guidelines uh, and also the, uh, the UN as I mentioned earlier has come in and, um, and came up with these uh, norms of responsible state behavior in cyberspace uh, they deal with a lot of the same aspects that I've been talking about now um, critical infrastructure for example because critical infrastructure can go can span borders electricity networks uh, submarine cables and example um, that, um, that does not come to concern an individual nation but uh, crosses borders so uh, these norms address those issues uh, critical infrastructure also supply chains uh, there's a uh, norm dealing with supply chains supply chain integrity it also crosses uh, borders um, and also incident reporting on an international level so international cooperation when it comes to incident reporting, uh, so that incidents occurring in one country um, become known um, rapidly uh, to other countries to deal with them and ideally prevent uh, the same thing happening there. Okay, let's turn to the situation in Liberia. So we've seen now what 
um, uh, the US and the EU have done over the last four decades in terms of cybersecurity uh, legislation and regulation. Um, what's the status here in Liberia? So we have um, the, the basic law here is the dealing with the uh, telecommunications sector is the 2007 Telecommunications Act. Uh, that, act that act actually does not mention cybersecurity with a single word. Um, but that's 2007. It's a long time ago. And cybersecurity was not as much of uh, an issue uh, here. Um, and the act it authorizes the LTA to develop regulations. Uh, we have an ICT policy here. The ICT policy uh, 2019 to 2024, uh, so expiring this year. And uh, again, it's a much broader ICT policy, not specifically cybersecurity only. Um, there's one chapter in there, chapter 5.5, five, uh, that deals with information safety and cybersecurity. We'll take a little bit closer look at that in a moment. Um, that's expiring this year, so there is a draft national cybersecurity strategy, 2025 to 29. Uh, that I understand is ready for consultation. Maybe the consultation process has already started. Um, there's, um, we'll take a look at that also in a moment. Uh, there's a cyber crime bill. We already learned about that from speakers this morning. The cyber crime uh, bill uh, draft is before Parliament currently for ratification. And there is also, but only proposed so far, I understand, uh, data protection and privacy legislation. So we've, we've seen these two fundamental uh, laws in both examples that I've uh, talked about, uh, the US and the EU, uh, cyber crime legislation and data protection and privacy legislation. Cyber crime bill is before Parliament uh, here, data protection and privacy legislation proposed only at this stage to be developed. Um, as far as I can see when I looked into it, um, there is no specific cybersecurity regulation uh, sitting on top of this legislation uh, here in Liberia. There is some sector-specific uh, material. Uh, in the financial sector, for example, the Central Bank of Liberia um, encourages uh, financial institutions implement security measures to protect customer data and prevent fraud. Um, I think it's more a guideline rather than a, uh, an actual binding uh, regulation. Um, in terms of uh, on the institutional uh, level, um, I believe the, so the only um, organization that I am aware of that specifically deals with, uh, with cybersecurity and cybercrime is the LCCPMA, uh, Liberia Cybercrime Prevention and Mitigation Agency, established in 2019. Um, and that was also part of the, um, the ICT policy, the current ICT policy, policy requires that, that such a body would be um, established. Um, I couldn't actually find a website LCCPMA only a Facebook page. So it would be interesting to hear from some of the um, uh, of the guests here, maybe later in the discussion. Uh, some of you are familiar, or maybe part of that organization. Um, what exactly that organization is currently doing, and what it might be doing in the future. Um, also, in terms of international regional cooperation, so Liberia has signed uh, the Malabo Convention. That's an African Union initiative um, in 2014, um, dealing with cybersecurity and personal data protection. So Liberia is a signatory to that. And also on the ECOWAS level, um, it's, uh, so the ECOWAS has uh, come up with a, with a cybercrime directive in 2011, um, a regional critical infrastructure protection policy 2017, and more recently, regional cybersecurity and cybercrime strategy in 2021. So similar to the EU model, I suppose, um, these are 
directives that ECOWAS encourages its member states to create national legislation in these areas. Uh, let's look at these different components, but only briefly because I know um, um, another speaker tomorrow will, will look into this um, in more detail because he's actually been involved in, in the work for the uh, ICD policy and also the ICD strategy that's currently going to consultation. So I'll just briefly outline uh, here what's in there. Um, the current policy, 20, uh, 20 ICT policy 2019 to 2024, um, has the objective to protect, the, I love this one, the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, or short CIA, nice, uh, another nice acronym there, of all systems and data assets of government um, bodies, as well as private sector, companies, civil society, and other organizations, and also individual citizens. So it covers all, all three sectors. And I particularly like that uh, this paragraph here was included in the uh, policy here in Liberia. Uh, this is the objective, to protect the CIA of systems and data assets while maintaining the openness of the internet, opportunities for innovation, and fundamental values of freedom of expression, privacy, and access to information, all of which are critical for the positive socioeconomic impacts of the internet. Um, and what that basically tells us, in my opinion, is that we should also be careful not to over-regulate, uh, so that we don't stifle innovation. Um, over-regulation can stifle uh, innovation and compromise some of these uh, fundamental rights. So we want to find the right balance regulate as far as necessary, but stopping short of compromising um, the openness of the internet uh, as innovation. So uh, I'll sign this um, uh, any time. I'm actually pleased to see that that clause was, is included in the, in the policy. Um, this is the chapter 5.5 in the policy that I mentioned earlier that deals with cybersecurity, and I've just highlighted here the key issues that are dealt with there. Uh, all the things we've talked about, so regional and international collaboration, uh, the requirement to establish a national um, cybersecurity body, or advisory committee, all these are policy objectives of the current ICT policy here in Liberia. Uh, secure the rights of the privacy of consumers, public sector and private sector, so MAX over there. MAX stands for ministries, agencies, and commissions, I believe. So that's basically public sector institutions and the private sector uh, as well. Um, the Protection of Children, um, the Cyber Crime Act, that's currently before Parliament actually deals with that. It has something on the uh, protection of, of children uh, in there. Um, rights of businesses, so that could uh, involve um, many things, intellectual property rights, for example, online in cyberspace. Um, anticipate cyber attacks and mitigate risks, so the requirement for, for risk um, assessment procedures. Um, foreign and local actors, so the international aspect. So a national cybersecurity strategy, uh, we have that. The strategy 2025 to 2029 is, is out, ready for consultation. Um, and again, specifically addressing critical infrastructure here. The CII, critical, critical information infrastructure. Um, and also, for example, SIM card registration, which um, is an important component in uh, enforcement and prosecution of cybercrime because uh, here in Liberia, like elsewhere in Africa, and pretty much around the world, um, most internet traffic is actually carried by the mobile networks through your mobile devices. And it's particularly important there that 
SIM cards are traceable to be able to enforce and prosecute uh, cybercrime. And in discussions yesterday, I learned that uh, SIM card registration is um, is implemented here in Liberia, in, in Liberia, um, but it's currently under review and strengthened um, to include biometric um, registration to to strengthen. Okay, so it's a lot in that one little chapter there. The current uh, policy, some additional policy directives in the current policy, um, <clears throat> develop an appropriate legal framework so, um, to draft um, cybersecurity legislation, update existing bills um, and review them regular intervals every two years, uh, compliance and enforcement. Critical infrastructure, in particular, and also the call for a national cybersecurity advisory committee. Um, with those public consultations, um, at least once a year. Collaborate with foreign partners regionally and globally, so that international um, information exchange uh, aspect. And the requirement to join the West African Computer Emergency Response Team, or CERT within one year of approval of this policy. Well, approval of this policy would have been in 2018 or 19. And I think as we can see now, as we look at this list, not a whole lot of this has actually been implemented in the last five years. Some things have, so the cybercrime bill is now before parliament, uh, the strategy is out. Uh, the cybercrime bill addresses some of the other issues, like child protection, for example. But a lot of these items <coughs> uh, have actually not been implemented. So there is quite a bit of work left to be done here in Liberia uh, in terms of cybersecurity legislation and regulation. And that's where the draft national cybersecurity strategy um, sets in, which sets the goals for the next five. 2024 uh, to 2029. Um, this document, and again, the speaker after me tomorrow, I think, will talk about it in more detail. There are short, shorter term goals in there for the next couple of years, and then medium to long term goals, 2027 to 2029 and beyond. Uh, the strategy has these three strategic pillars build, secure, and sustain. So build uh, refers to the creation of a legal and regulatory environment for cybersecurity. Secure means strengthening the um, cybersecurity readiness um, of the country. And then sustain, to sustain that in the long term through awareness campaigns, capacity building measures, something that, that the President uh, addressed uh, this morning, capacity building, training of young people, and international cooperation. Mm -hmm. yeah. the, uh, the objectives and goals of the National Cybersecurity Strategy here, um, for example, let's go detail, but for example, encouraging public-private partnerships, PPPs, to strengthen cybersecurity. Obviously because um, critical infrastructure, for example, is often, some critical infrastructure is operated by private sector operators. Um, so a cooperation between the public and private sector is important. Promoting yeah. uh, security awareness and education campaigns at all levels of society, including schools, government agencies, and private businesses. And um, also creating a computer security incident response team, or CSERT. Um, so for those of you who find that confusing, what's the difference between a CERT and a CSERT that we just talked about uh, before? Uh, essentially the same thing. A dedicated team uh, to deal with cybersecurity incidents 
The difference is that the cert um, is um, the, the term cert goes back to a university in the U.S. that established the first cert, and you can only call yourself a cert if you're affiliated with them or licensed by them. Or affiliated with them. Um, so that's why in a lot of countries you'll see the name C cert instead. Essentially, they do the same. Oh, and um, yeah, because also we don't have that yet here in Nigeria. I don't think we have a national cert or C cert um, in existence. Um, briefly on the cybercrime bill, as I mentioned, uh, it's before Parliament, um, and Liberia is actually one of um, only a few countries that don't have cybercrime legislation in place yet. Uh, this map here, I believe, is from 2021. Yeah, 2021. So some of these countries, so the red countries are the ones that in 2021 did not have cybercrime legislation in place. And the different shades of blue, so most countries have legislation in place, but light blue ones have draft legislation in place where there's no legislation. Most of the red ones are in Africa, as we can see, and including uh, quite a few relatively troubled places like Libya, Somalia, Eritrea, uh, Chad, uh, Central African Republic, DRC. Uh, interestingly, also in Namibia. Um, Quite sure whether they've made progress since 2021, but at least in 2021, they, even Namibia didn't have a cybercrime uh, act. Um, <clears throat> Namibia is typically um, one of the more progressive um, uh, countries. Um, in this context, and a few in, in South America. Um, so, I would say it's high time and very timely that Namibia is now enacting its own cybercrime bill. And we talked about that. It uh, includes, um, defines the different cyber offenses and uh, penalties uh, that apply uh, to it, uh, to them. Um, specifically deals with critical infrastructure, again, the draft cybersecurity bill here in Liberia talks about Critical infrastructure in particular. As we saw before, some of the other countries, US and EU, have dedicated separate legislation dealing with critical infrastructure that arose when uh, that became more important. Um, here in Liberia now, we have the opportunity to include all of that in a single uh, law, uh, which reduces the risks of, uh, of having conflict in legislation. Also, international cooperation, which is important. So, it's good to do um, a brief gap analysis, um, comparing the situation in Liberia that we now looked at, comparing it with the, the most economy, the most advanced economies uh, in the world in this regard, the U.S. and the uh, EU. Um, as uh, we saw, so there's a lot of work left to be done. We have a policy expiring this year, and some of the year we have a, a policy expiring this year for the past five years. We saw not a lot of the requirements in there have actually been implemented. This will be followed by the um, draft national cybersecurity strategy for the next five years, which is going to consultation right now. So my hope would be that um, the, um, the issues um, um, in that strategy um, will be dealt with now in these um, coming five years, and the relevant legislation and regulation will be developed. We have the cybercrime bill before Parliament. We have data protection and privacy legislation proposed. Um, 
we don't really have any uh, more detailed regulations yet sitting on top of these laws, but that's because we don't really have the legislation in place yet. So as, as I mentioned earlier this morning, regulations typically go into more detail on the implementation of the laws, and we're really in the process here of developing the laws in the first place. So regulations uh, will follow once those laws are uh, enacted. Um, also, as far as I'm aware, there are no country-specific best practice guidelines of the kind that uh, we talked about earlier. But again, of course, um, we are free to use um, other countries' guidelines or other organizations' guidelines, like the NIST framework, for example, in the US or the EU, maybe adapt that a little bit to specific <coughs> requirements here locally in Siberia, and then we um, publish those. Uh, on the institutional level, we don't have a CERT or C-CERT uh, here yet. Um, and again, my, my question and discussion later would be, <coughs> could the LCC PMA possibly uh, play that role or uh, evolve uh, to becoming uh, this uh, institution, uh, CSER, or should we think about creating a new dedicated um, body, uh, a CERT or CSER. So, let's see how we go with the time. I, I think I have all afternoon, right? I'm the only speaker. To, yeah, so. Um, what I'd like to do is show you that other document, um, the, the draft cybersecurity regulatory framework for Liberia that I was asked to, uh, to put together. Um, so what that does is considering that here in Liberia we're only at the very beginning of creating cybersecurity specific legislation which will then be followed by some more detailed regulations. Um, the regulatory framework I've put together basically just outlines the key points that should be covered in future legislation and regulations. And in the absence of, of those things currently, that's not being in existence, um, but the document could also be developed into a or used as an interim stopgap regulation in the meantime, whilst the additional legislation that is needed is being drafted and passed, which, which, which will take time to, to draft and pass and enact legislation. So can we put that uh, document on? That PDF that I Yeah, after we've, we've gone through the documents, we've, it's not very long, it's um, a PDF, yes. So, 
there was some security regulations. So it's obviously not really regulations, because as we know, regulations typically sit on top of legislation, which we don't have uh, a lot of yet. But as I explained, the purpose of this document is to, um, to it, it represents a regulatory framework, key issues that should be included in future legislation and regulation here in Nigeria. And um, could be used, or could be developed into um, a regulation of issues that, that is not covered in legislation yet, to cover the, uh, uh, the time in between um, until the legislation is ready. Uh, as you can see here, so um, here's the table of contents, and if we just quickly go through that, um, you'll see it. It deals with all the issues we've come across now, as we were looking at what those other countries have, and what we eventually will need here in, in Liberia as well. Um, starting with how regulations typically start, general provisions, title and purpose, yeah, we don't have to uh, read through all that. Scope. All public and private entities, and yeah, I've put some comments there on the right as discussion points uh, now or later in the discussion um, during the conference. Um, what's an entity? How shall we define an entity? So these regulations apply to public and private entities. So not individual citizens. This is not really something that, that applies to individual citizens, but to entities which um, should include public and private sector entities, so government bodies, uh, corporations, um, and individuals if they're sole proprietors, yeah, um, and, uh, they will be covered as well. So anyone who uh, processes um, uh, data or information that's potentially vulnerable to uh, cyber but not the private individual uh, themselves at the end of the chain. Uh, then there's a chapter of definitions, so uh, terms that are used in the document. I, stand up, I believe we'll share this after the conference as well. You can read to them. Um, so CII defines cybersecurity itself. What's a data breach? What are digital services? What's encryption? What's an entity, as we just discussed? What's a firewall? What's identity theft? So terms and acronyms used in the document are explained here in this chapter. What's an incident in terms of cybersecurity, cyber incident? What's ICT? Uh, what's malware? Multi-factor authentication? What's penetration testing? Most of you will be familiar with all these terms, but some users of uh, such a framework may not, so that's why we have that chapter there. Then, coming to uh, governance and institutional framework, so as we saw, um, the more advanced economies in terms of cybersecurity all have a national body to deal with cybersecurity, something that's generically called the National Cybersecurity Authority, uh, or NCA. So the NCA is to be established as the primary body to coordinate national efforts in cybersecurity and provide guidance to public and private sectors. Uh, it shall develop national security, cybersecurity strategies, set standards, conduct regular risk assessments and audits, and provide cybersecurity awareness, education, and training for so all of the things we talked about um, in this presentation and that we saw implemented in. Uh, the question could be, um, could that role be played by the LTA um, itself, or should a separate uh, body specifically for cybersecurity be uh, created? Something up uh, to discussion. Um, or could be um, the LCC PMA that I mentioned, could that organization perhaps evolve? to become something like an NCA. Um, 
um, different options there to be considered. Uh, roles, and roles, roles and responsibilities of entities and entities public. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for your help.